there's maybe like a conservation of risk law that we could cr- invent, which is like you can move it around, but mm-hmm. you can't have none. You, so, you cannot create or destroy risk. You just, yeah, you just, you can just move it around. Move it around. Yeah, you just switch it around. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. This is Brave New Work, a podcast about reinventing our organizations and the search for a more adaptive and human way of working. I'm Aaron Dignan, and I'm joined by my intrepid co-host, Rodney Evans. Hello, everyone. On today's episode, we're going to talk about using people to solve, and I have air quotes on that, uh, system problems. But before we get into that, let's check in and see if we have any problems. Let's check in. (laughs) We have no problems. Everything's great. (laughs) Everything's perfect now. Okay. So our check-in round question for today, our question that gets us present, gets us shared airtime, gets us rolling is this one. When doing a project, what needs to be in place for you to feel like it's going well? I think the number one thing for me is related to communication. I just like hearing from the people I'm working with. So even if it's like work in progress or, you know, how it's going or what they're stuck on or what have you, even if I'm not meant to help, I just like the feeling of you know, we're moving together, particularly in a remote world where Mm -hmm. we're all separate, we're not in the same room jamming on it. Just nice to like see signs of life from the system. And then I guess the other one for me would probably just be some progress on a rhythm, which is something I'm not particularly gifted at. But when I do it, well, I always feel great. So like an hour a day or a half an hour a day or a little bit of a nudge forward each increment feels like, all right, well, we may not be done yet, but we're, we're getting there as opposed to a day that's wasted. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I dig that. For me, there are two things that happen when I'm working on a project. One is if I'm not having my own insights based on doing the work, I don't feel like it's going well. Like (laughs) if there's no, if I'm not having moments where I'm like, okay, I thought of a new thing that by virtue of doing this, my thinking has expanded or changed in some way. Usually it's not a project I should be doing. And and incidentally, I also think that that's something that happens over time. Like if I've been on something, whether it's a client thing or an internal thing for like a year, I often just get to a point where I'm like, I'm not coming up with new cool shit. I should recuse myself from this. And then the other thing is validation from users. So I, it's hard for me to feel like work is going well in a vacuum ever. And nice. when I'm on projects that are vacuum like projects, it's really hard for me to stay motivated. Like I need to have contact with the people who are actually going to make use of the work and to be <laughs> hearing from them, whether it's doing what it's supposed to be doing for it to feel like it's going well for me. That's awesome. I like that checking question a lot, actually. And I think that'd be a good one for new teams to yes. get to know each other as a chartering question. Yeah, I love that. So try do that, that, folks. Also, do team charters, y'all. Always. They'll save you so much time on the back end. Always. Okay, so today's topic is the intersection between individuals, risk, and systems, and how we you know, approach that perhaps in the wrong way sometimes. And so I'll start by asking you, What made you want to talk about this? This was your idea, your topic? So uh, I'm involved in a program right now outside of the Ready where I'm doing some coaching work. And what I'm noticing is that every time there is an issue with a client or with a system or with a policy about the program itself, (laughs) somehow the responsibility is coming to the coaches to solve it in some way. And, And not just solve it like, this is a present problem for you. It's much more like this is a problem that we programmatically are experiencing and here's what we want you to do to fix it. So that, so sometimes that shows up in the form of like, make sure you say these things to the clients. Sometimes it shows up in the form of like, the system is down and now we need you to send these emails. Sometimes it shows up in the form of like, if you if you're going to do this thing in a non-standard way, then you need to communicate it to everyone so that they have a similar ability to do the non-standard thing that you did in the moment. Just like bullshit like that that I'm like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yo, I'm being paid to be a dope coach to this one individual, not to like <laughs> carry with me the like script on the, you know, on the what's that thing called when you're a waitress, which I was. <laughs> 
you know, know a flip a flip chart a, yeah, a notepad like the the thing that you take orders on i guess it was an order pad the one that i had was like the fake leather order pad that you put in your yeah, apron yeah, yeah. It always made me feel very official i should be a waitress realistically anyway the point is every time i attend one of these meetings where they give us more things that we must say because there was this one issue i feel more and more like a waitress who's like running through the specials right right and it's like 98% of the clients in this scenario do not give a shit about what I'm talking about. But I have been told that these are things that like I must say. And I'm like, how did this become my problem? I mean, I think the what you're talking about is part of a broader phenomenon, which is the idea of doing systems work, either in the form of more interesting and soulful agreements that people actually buy into and shape, yes. or in the form of technology, platforms, solutions. Yes. It just feels like a lot of work. And so instead, it's a lot easier to just tell this role or this individual to be superhuman and solve it by just being amazing or following the description or doing this one extra special thing. And so what we end up doing is just, you know, essentially, we just at, we pile it on people. So, you know, if we have an issue, the first instinct is, can we just put this on somebody's shoulders? Right. Let's just add this responsibility to cover our butts in this particular scenario. But to your point, like there are a bunch of things that are problematic about that. And and we're going to get into some examples because though this is something that I've been experiencing and frustrated with very recently, it's something that I've experienced a million times in my career working for big companies and see my clients experience all the time. So I don't think that it's unique. I think you're totally right that it's very typical and very patterned. And the other thing is, besides it being basically unfair to the individual, it is also something that doesn't create an evolutionary system. <laughs> like right, you just right. keep propping up this broken system through the heroics and the overwork and the constraining of the people in it rather than doing the thing you should do, which is have a look-see at what systemically would make this less effortful, more scalable, more consistent, more intuitive and trying that. You know, we talk often about how interpersonal tension is often system tension. And we should do a sure. whole separate episode on that. <laughs> this is one very specific version of that, though, that has more to do with the power structure where someone is like, you know what, this aspect of the system is broken. And all of you are going to like stick your finger in the hole to like <laughs> keep it from keep the dam from breaking. And it's like, bro, the dam is definitely going to break at some time. Right, right. Yeah. And it is funny, you're making me think back to when I was a waiter. Mm. Uh, and the whole thing about push the fish. So push the fish. Push the fish. We have too much fish. It's Saturday or the day before the fish comes, and so we have too much left over. And now the waiters have to go out into the world and push the fish, which is funny because the actual solution is, hey, could we work on our inventory management, our flow, our understanding demand, our menu? all those things that would actually eliminate that problem and optimize us. Mm -hmm. But instead, it's like, eh, just have the waiters flog the fish. Yeah, <laughs> right? and it's a great example. And I was actually also going to use an example from uh, wait staff because I worked with a large restaurant company a few years ago and heard from someone who had been a former server that over time, basically the script – that kept being added to for the server became like a 13 point script of things that Amazing. they needed to say when they approached the table. <laughs> and it was really, obviously it was frustrating for them for a variety of reasons. But one of the reasons was, which is, it was all, a lot of it was very push the fish. It was like, you know, it's, it's strawberry margarita Tuesday. And if you don't yeah. say that we'll have too many strawberries and this is the high margin thing. And we've got to hit this tart, blah, blah, blah. But like, there were two sides of that issue that I think are relevant and that we see everywhere. One is when you're that server and you go up to the guy that comes every Tuesday and sits at the bar and orders a dry martini, he does not want to hear the 13 things. Like, no, you can't. It's and customer you can't, negative. It's customer negative. And so to continually say to the server, be customer positive and make them happy and also do this thing you know that they hate and script. don't want you to do <laughs> is like, is what so are unfair. they supposed to do with that? And then also you're screwing with their incentives because like they're the ones who are potentially going to not get a tip because they pushed the fish or because like 
they know what this guy wants and yet they're talking to him about this strawberry margarita, their right. tip is potentially ratcheting down and the people who are insisting on these things aren't going to feel that. And, and the callback for me, and I think I've mentioned this on the show before, but if I haven't, you know, tune in, is when we worked with a particular uh, burger joint that was drive through a long, long time ago, this is before the ready, what we learned is that the size of things on the menu mattered in the mm. drive through And they knew that they had better return and better loyalty if somebody ordered a hot dog the first time through versus a burger. Interesting. And so what... what they did obviously is we made the hot dog bigger and more dynamic on the digital menu. And then people order more hot dogs. The alternative, which would be playing into what you're talking about is just make the people on the other end of the line in the drive through flog the hot dog. Exactly. And it's like, why not just make it bigger on the menu? People will think they had this great idea to have a hot dog today. They won't even know that they were nudged and you know, they'll enjoy it more than they would have the terrible other thing they were going to order. And then they'll come back. Exactly. And so it is, yeah, like those system solutions are there, but in order to make that happen, you have to have a team that's willing to tune into that. You have to have a menu that is updatable. You have to have like systems in place that allow you to respond to your point about resiliency and robustness. Like you have to be built to respond. Absolutely. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about where we see this and sort of the different phenomena that come up. So the first one that we start that <laughs> we've flavors. already started on is like the the sort of extra bullet point in your job description phenomenon. And so there's there's the way that this happens with servers. There's the way that this happens certainly with call centers. Like oh my, my god, god, when you pick up the phone and somebody launches into a 90 second thing, like you already hate them. And those poor people who are making like twelve dollars an hour to just get like punched in the face every second of At their best. lives. Uh, by their customers who just want to like scream at them all day. It's like most of what those people have to say in their scripts are things that if there was a good app, if there was good communication, if there was good information designed by the company about the product, that customer service person wouldn't be like, hello, I'm calling from AT&T, blah, 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 blah. And it's to your point before we got on this call that that is about de-risking, right? They're afraid Absolutely. that the person's going to say the wrong thing. And in so doing, they give them the wrong thing to say. They're, they're basically like, if this person is allowed to be a human being with their customer and just tune into what they need and be empathetic and authentic and help find a solution, like let's say customer service at Bonobos did. Or Zappos. That, or, or, right. you know, or Virgin Mobile Canada, where I've been to the call center and seen how authentic it is. Everybody else does it this other way, where it's like, yeah, you have to say these things. And when they lose their mind, you have to actually tune in and just do the script, follow the next bullet point. And I actually had, I actually had a call from my dad the other day he was on the phone with his cable provider, which is thankfully not one of the Ready's clients. And he was like, look, I, you know, you're about to ratchet my price up by like 30% for the same service. It doesn't work for me. The competitor in my area has the same speed of service for 30% less. Mm -hmm. Unless you keep my price where it is today, I'm going to switch. Mm -hmm. And their script literally would not allow them to save his business. They were just like, see ya. Like, we're totally cool with that. So we went to the store, talked to the manager and was like, hey, here's the deal. I know you guys don't want to lose a customer. I'm worth $1,800 a year to you guys for 10 years. Like, there's just, there's no sense in losing me over $20 a month, right? Especially when the competitor's lower priced, right? Manager is like, script does not compute. Goodbye. Yeah, so he bounced. Amazing. And like, that's a great example of sort of the information aspect but if we put our systems hat on, part of the reason that the script is 25 points and that it will never have language for every scenario is probably that the pricing plan is way too complicated. <laughs> totally. I think about some of the more disruptive organizations, businesses out there. And one of the things that the Warby Parkers and the Casper mattresses and the Everlanes have in common is really straightforward transparent, simple pricing without sales and discounts and promotions and a very short and tight menu of options. And when you have those things, then your customer service person doesn't need to memorize an 83-page handbook of shenanigans and yep. then still not be able to answer an emergent question. 
Well, and you can trust them to navigate the system with basic human intelligence because they can hold it in their mind. Exactly. Right? Like, I don't need 10 days of training to learn the in and out menu. It's just like, okay, I have a burger. I have a cheeseburger. There's a couple things on the secret menu I can do, but like, that's kind that's of it. That's it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Would you like a chocolate shake or a vanilla shake? <laughs> right. So so I right. do think that that simplicity plays a role here. And, and, and funnily enough, this instinct to solve risk with individual action and with individual pressure adds complication to your point. So it started as a one bullet point thing. Hey, welcome to, you know, Schlotsky's, uh, may I take your order, please? And then it was like, let's add another bullet and another bullet and another bullet and another bullet. And suddenly we're just swimming in org debt. We're swimming in org debt. It's not doing the thing that it was meant to do. It's probably having the counter impact. But the people who are nowhere near the customer are like, good thing, good thing we added bullet number 18. (laughs) And I used to see this a lot also when I worked in HR, you know, I worked in, in an investment bank during the financial crisis. So a big part of my job was laying people off. And those are always very difficult conversations for a variety of reasons. But one of the things that we were frequently told by legal is never say I'm sorry. Right. And it's like when you're a human being who's sitting across the table from someone that you've maybe known for years who whether they're in a difficult situation or not, is getting bad news. You know, right. there there's a very small handful of people who are like, I will take my money and sign that right now for you. I already have another job. This was just gravy. Peace. Like, that doesn't happen that often. And the fact that, like, even saying, like, I'm sorry this is happening to you or how you're <laughs> feeling right now is, like, becomes one of the verboten things on the script that you cannot do. It just, every time we put these constraints around the people in our systems, because from a systems perspective, we don't want to look at what the right thing really is that we can stand behind, we actually add a lot of risk. We add a lot of risk to our systems. And, you know, I know that there are lawsuits out there that could have been avoided by just a more human conversation where it was like, this sucks for you. We're sorry that this is happening. We want to do our best to make it right. What does that look like? Here we go. And instead, in our quest to de-risk, we actually push the risk to the edge and create more of it. Yeah, just different kinds. There's a there's maybe like a conservation of risk law that we could cr- invent, which is like you can move it around, but mm-hmm. you can't have none. You, so, you cannot create or destroy risk. You just, yeah, you just, you can just move it around. Move it around. Yeah, yeah you just so switch like, it around. Yeah, don't do that new app thing, but then you've moved it into the innovation space and now Uber's going to eat your lunch or don't do this, you know, like it, you can move risk but you can't get rid of it. I really like that as a concept. We should we should explore that more. That's right. And I think the place that this shows up to me the most is in the tech risk mm-hmm, phenomenon. Mm-hmm. So sure. switching gears from like the what we do to the human beings um who are dealing with customers to the tech space I have had so many lived experiences of this, but also see it in my clients all the time, where because a system that would help us is quote unquote too risky, then we push the avoidance of error to the people. And Mm -hmm. I'll give just a couple of easy examples of that. One is I can't tell you how many organizations I see that still don't have a useful compensation system. And what that ends up looking like is HR people looking at spreadsheets that are 80 columns wide and a thousand rows long. And their job is to cut those spreadsheets manually, save them under different file names, be sure that in email they go to the right people and that there's no information that this manager shouldn't see. No leakage. No leakage. That is such a fucking stupid way to handle (laughs) confidential information because the comp systems aren't secure enough to implement like you're putting so much on the human beings to like check and double check and make sure because you don't want to do the work of implementing installing learning something that would automate the risk yeah and that is the accidental leakage risk that they worry about and then in many cases when they don't have a system the alternative is people just find or make their own so then we do it in text instead of an email or we do we start our own Slack instance without permission. Like people find ways to solve problems and then, you know, and then you don't even know what they're doing. And that is always hilarious to me because I'm often in projects in touch with the head of 
IT or the CTO. And and when I start talking to them about, you know, Trello or Slack or Notion or G Suite, they're like, no, 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 no. We don't, we don't use that here. And like that is not secure. And three days into the project, I'm like, okay, well, 50% of the people here are on Slack. So I'm not really <laughs> sure. Like, I don't know what your policy is, but fly I, they've figured yeah. it out and are yeah. actively using this. And tool. you have no access to what they're doing instead right. of what you would have, which is it's administrative completely access. Completely unregulated and not yeah. discoverable and not maintained at all. Yeah. So, you know. Good job. Yeah. You're so this is it. going super well. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's, it's one of those funny things where, to your point, it's like it's all such a fallacy, but the person at the top of the technology org can say that's too risky, so we don't do that. And there's a policy that says we don't, so we're left in the right here. And it's like, well, like, does that matter if in actuality in the world it's not true? Well, I do think that, it, that to your point, there's a part of this that expresses itself through required heroics, push the fish. And there's a part of this that expresses itself through theater which is like, let's pretend as if. And I also want to point out, a lot of the talk so far has been about the top-down expression of this. Yes. But there's an inverse phenomenon too, which is the chief innovation officer, the chief security officer, the chief whatever that's going to solve our problem with quality. We actually create a different kind of heroics in theater when we're like, yeah, instead of fixing the system problem around quality here, which would inc involve like, Doing what Toyota does, giving people the big red button, teaching people to speak up, giving voice, empowering, you know, like all those things that would allow quality to be caught instead of jammed through. We're like, no, no, we'll just let's find a big leader, big leader, big leader in charge of quality. They'll figure it out. They'll sort it out. And by the way, you know how they sort it out with more bullet points. More <laughs> so bullet points, more it like controls. creates not only is that person's role unfair to them because it's not a real solution, but then they go back and create more of the required heroics that ultimately don't get made manifest. So like the whole game gets compounded and compounded by itself, mm -hmm. like any org debt, but especially true in this case. I was in a conversation with someone where we basically talked about how anytime we're with a new client and we talk to someone whose job is basically, quote unquote, making sure something is broken. So it's like if my job is to make sure that your expense reports are filed or your performance mm -hmm. management mm -hmm. reviews are in or your vendors are vetted or your technology is secure. Like if my job is to just monitor the activities of other people to be sure they don't make a mistake, that shouldn't be a job. It is a signal of poor org design that you've had to put a human being in the mix to overcome a systemic deficiency. And this is why, with a very few exceptions that get their special treatment, I think the idea of a project management office and project managers is not a great thing. No? Now, all, I'm all shocked. All respect to project managers, because you do God's work out there, and I understand that. You're dealing with systems that are not healthy, yeah. and you're making it work. But like you're doing triage medical work on the battlefield in an environment where we should just stop fighting. And where adults should be adults keeping commitments with each other and moving work forward together using systems that remind them and systems that hold their status and systems that keep things moving and systems that make things visible. And like the fact that we don't do that creates the need for this activity, which again, you do heroically, but like in a perfect world, a team of adults can come together and ship a freaking thing without a teacher or an parent or an adult being like, all right, well, how's it going? Where's your bathroom pass? Did you do this? Like, it's Friday. Where's right. the ship? Right. You know, anytime I see a project where they're like, well, you know, it's a it's a failing of the project manager that this is behind. I'm like, <laughs> is it though? I don't think that's right. Um, and, and, and when you talk about having the right systems in place, particularly around project management, because I have this conversation a lot with people when they're like, well, if we pull out the project managers, nothing will get done. Right. And I'm like, you know what helps get things done is reliance on human shame. <laughs> like if we have transparency around work and we have a disciplined meeting rhythm where I have to show up and be like, oh, yeah, I bricked it again. 
that shifts the tide like way more than me having this one person that in private is like, Rodney, your status is yellow again this week. And I just yeah, really yeah. think if you could blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. If I have to show up to the meeting where all the people are and they all have made progress and I haven't made progress week on week on week on week on week, that problem, it solves itself. So having the checkers who check the work instead of the checkers being like, how do we make Rodney feel ashamed that she is not fulfilling her commitments to the organization or motivated? But, you know, let's be honest. If somebody's just like kind of procrastinating or spacing, transparency and and a little social pressure are usually a pretty easy way to get it unstuck. And the other thing is when people say, well, this is an incredibly complicated project and all these different people from all these different departments have to work on it to make it happen. And so we need this orchestrator. Again, on the one hand, I'm like, yeah, empathy. I get it. You're right. There's so much going on here. But then the underlying signal, and I think that's the theme of this episode, if we're talking about the what to do about this stuff, tune into what's going on underneath the surface. So why is it that 18 different people from 18 different teams have to collaborate to make a thing that's important. Mm -hmm. Could it be that the structure is borked, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Could it be that those people should actually be sitting in the same room or in the same Slack channel and not reporting to other people and actually focused on getting this done together where that was their dedication, right? Then suddenly things might shift. It's only because they're partially distracted. They're partially attentive to this project that nobody really owns except for the PM. And you know what I mean? Like it's this systemic pattern where if you chase it down to its roots, you're like, yeah, the reason we need to do this is because other parts of the operating system are not properly dealt with. And so, yeah, we can put a Band-Aid on it again and do the thing we're talking about in this episode again, or we can actually do some rewiring. And project management is a really good example of there is a role in what you're talking about that I think is quite useful, which is basically being the the systems thinker around the project. So like, if you want to have a role carved out for the person who's going to facilitate and teach around tool maintenance and draft and bring the working agreements for how the team works, or even just schedule the meetings to make sure the team chartering, whatever that sure. stuff is, that's that's valid. And and certainly when we work cross-functionally and we've got a day job, it, it can be hard in the absence of stewardship. But there's a big difference between someone who is looking at what systemically is going to enable progress in this team versus someone who is just there to ensure compliance is a significant shift. So the last one that we want to talk about is about the avoidance of clarity and sort of pushing that fogginess onto the individual. So basically saying, we're not going to specify, and so you have to deal with the lack of, of clarification and you know, good luck and God bless. So what are what are some examples of that? Yeah, so this is where a lot of the interpersonal tension creeps in that really should be pointed back to the system. And one example of this, I've thought about this a lot lately because I just keep seeing it in different places, is where leaders, where two leaders have different ideas about something that are in competition with one another and they avoid making a decision one way or the other to try for now somehow I see leaders convince themselves that that does not have impact. But but (laughs) that that avoidance of clarity, that refusal to get to the other side of the conflict and have an agreement for how we're going to roll plays Mm -hmm. itself out fractally at at every single level of your organization and in places that you can't even imagine. So like – That shit is showing up in comp discussions, in promotion discussions, in technology selection, in vendor negotiation, like a a significant misalignment at the top and a refusal to create clear and specific intent creates so much risk that individuals have to negotiate throughout your system. It is bananas. Yeah, it becomes like factional and it becomes strategic and political about which thing am I going to play into, which perspective am I going to align with, for sure. And like, how do we compromise these things that are in opposition, you and me, when the people four levels above us haven't figured it out? Yeah, and it's just been it's been multiplied. And you know, we're not uh, whole cloth fans of Amazon, but the whole idea of disagree, but commit speaks to the solution here, which is just like, let's like pick away 
and we'll do it for three months and we'll see how it goes, you know? Yeah. And if we can't decide which of us is right and neither one of us wants to give, let's flip a coin. Like, let's do something rather than be in the in-between, right? Because better to do something and actually learn from the full commitment to that direction and then pivot or then double down than to be like, yeah, let's just stay soupy and be in a tug of war and nothing will happen. Yeah, let's experience the pain of picking wrong and then course correct rather than let everybody come to work to try to influence and negotiate and compromise in ways that are impossible every single day. Which is one more way to put it on the individual instead of putting it in the system. The other big thing that I see in this area is around financials and spending. And, you know, in most big companies below a very senior level, there is no clarity around what people can spend, what their discretionary spending thresholds are. Because <laughs> the argument that I hear from CFOs is like, well, if we told people that they could spend that much, our budget would be out of control. Like right, everyone right, just right. assumes that every single person in a system is going to spend up to the absolute max every single month straight that they the, are allowed. Straight to, to the spend. mall. Yeah. The data does not back that up. Incidentally, like when people have the authority to spend money, they tend not to. But because that <laughs> is the mentality and and the way that that plays out is we don't say to people – here's what you are allowed to spend in service of doing your role or fulfilling the company's purpose or, you know, keeping your team productive or whatever. And then we put it on the individual to try to figure out what is acceptable in the absence of any specific clarity or guidelines. And that feels that feels really unfair for a variety of reasons. One of which definitely plays into equity, which is like there are definitely some people who are just going to be more willing to be like, you know what, fuck it, I'm throwing a pizza party and like everybody can just eat it. And again, it just it creates a lot of inefficiency and a lot of soupiness for the individual when they're like, uh, should I or should I not? Should I buy the new yeah. laptop charger? And it's like, if you're someone who's making $100,000 a year, I don't want you to spend four seconds thinking about a purchase that is less than $500 that would significantly make your life better. <laughs> like you are worth too much to be inefficient because you can't spend a little bit of money. Right. And we've talked before about this on the show, but like the the Ritz Carlton rule, it's actually two thousand dollars per guest per incident that anyone at the company is able to spend in order to resolve that incident, which is way more than most corporate, you know, executives are allowed to spend on an incident without checking with somebody. And it's across the entire ecosystem, which I think is nice. And in that case, it's targeted at incidents. It's not yes. a do whatever you want with it any time of the day, but it's the same principle. And we do the same thing at the ready. I mean, I think we have, a, I, f I forget whether it's three or 4,000. I think it's 3,000 per per trimester that each individual member can spend in whatever way they see fit to serve the purpose. And it is funny, like sometimes people do put it together and do interesting things with it. But I would say only 20 or 30% of that money gets spent. Exactly. But it's clear. And so because it's clear, people don't have to spend cycles being like, well, I don't know what the criteria <laughs> is and I don't know who would have to approve this and I don't know what's reasonable. It's like, just just do it. Just yeah. do it. Do so it. that is just another place where and, – and there are probably a lot of examples that people who are working in large companies can think of around the financial piece of this because I do think finances tend to be a place where – things get so locked down in big systems and people right. have so little authority to steward the company's resources that crazy stuff ends up happening in terms of the heroics that individuals have to perform and the risk individuals have to take on, including just like spending their own money because it's not worth it because the system refuses to be specific, be declarative and do actual systems design work. So if you all like what you're hearing, please leave us a review, a download, a subscription, or read our app. You know, <laughs> shout out from the mountaintops. Whatever you're into, we would really appreciate it. Let the people know. A quick tip of the hat to Taylor Marvin for making us sound good every week. Brave New Work is produced by The Ready, where we help organizations around the world change the way they work. You can get in touch with us by emailing podcast at theready.com. And as for you, thanks for listening. Now go change something. <laughs>